and bienvenidos. <laughs> this is our Sunday hybrid service. We acknowledge and offer our gratitude to the indigenous people who saw the land as sacred and cared for our lands. Here in our building, our worship is on the unceded ancestral territory of the Akashiman and Tongva tribes. My name is Rachel Daniels. I'm your worship associate today. And we have our returning guest speaker, Anna Miguel, from Border Angels. In these difficult times, it is important to hear from those whose actions save lives, bring compassion, and demonstrate the best of humanity, like Border Angels. We started today's service with the music video, One Tribe, by the Black Eyed Peas. Personally, I question some of the images, but not the song's message. We have to stop demonizing human beings. Refugees and immigrants are not likely terrorists. They are often the first victims of terrorism. We are on this planet together, and we're so fortunate to have the ideas and skills of so many diverse people under our flag and so many more seeking their freedom by joining us. And we are one tribe. There are candles over to the side there, which they're here in the sanctuary, and feel free to light a candle at any time for whatever or whomever is on your heart today. And you can light those at any time during the service. And usually my husband Brian comes up to light the chalice for me, but he hurt his back. And so fortunately, we have T here who is going to light our chalice for us today as I read the chalice lighting words. The chalice represents light hope, and the tr quest for truth. It is now when we are called as witnesses of the world to mend it, to change its course, to restore it. It is now when we are called upon to bring this added light into the world. Thank you, T. Not all Unitarians share the same beliefs or opinions. Our shared worship brings us together with meaning we find in the eight principles, which is on the back of your order of service. By coming together as a community, we create that which is greater, wiser, and more compassionate than our individual selves. Today's service focuses on our first, second, and sixth principles. The first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. And the sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And by the way, happy Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo, as you guys probably know, it marks the anniversary of the 1862 victory by Mexican troops over invading French forces at the Battle of Puebla. This triumph was over the better equipped and more numerous French troops. And just as a side note, Mexican Independence Day is on September 16th to commemorate Mexico's freedom from Spanish rule in 1821. And yes, I had to look that up. <laughs> And Don's going to put up a slide now that shows our upcoming services. Next week, we have Yvette McDonald. The following week, Don West Jr., then Reverend Stephanie, and then Reverend Celia. And all of these speakers are fantastic and definitely will nourish our souls and our spirit. Is that the same? Okay. Um, the... And there's the slide with the upcoming services. And then some more announcements. On the first Thursday of every month, we join other congregations in providing meals to the unhoused. And each person brings a dish so you don't have to be responsible for the entire meal. 
Every Monday at noon, we have a Zoom at noon discussion group led by our own Pog, uh, Paul Bogdan over there. And it's just a chance to get to know people. And it's really sort of fun. We have a topic every week, which we hardly ever get to. But we mostly chat. Anyway, we look forward to each and every one of you joining us. And if you want to get on our email list to receive the notices and the links, um, please see any one of us and we can put you, sign you up for email. And then the last is the pledge drive. And no, I haven't gotten mine in either, but um, please think about making your pledges and submitting those. Before we get to our centering thoughts, we'll see if there are any visitors, maybe that have been here the first or second time that would like to identify yourselves, your names, how you got here. And if not, that's fine too. And we're just gonna take a moment to greet each other as Carol plays us some of her beautiful music. And now we have our centering thoughts, and they will be up on the screen. And I say thoughts. There were about 20 that I really liked, but I got it down to two. So we have two centering thoughts, and we're going to read those together. Okay. The first, small acts, small acts when multiplied, when multiplied by, millions by millions of people and transform, can transform the world. Howard Zinn. Now the next one, you have two, you have two hands, one, one to, to help yourself, yourself and the second, second to help, to help others. others. And when I got to the second one, I thought, did Audrey Hepburn really say that? So I put in the quote and it came up. Oh, yeah, it's attributed to her, but that's nice. I like it. Now we're going to turn to the wonderful Carol Cole for our opening hymn. Please stand as you're able. We'll have the words on the screen. And we're only going to sing the first three verses. It's number 121 in your book, and it's We'll Build a Land. We'll build a land where they find up the broken wheel. When the captives grow free, when the oil of gladness dissolves a morning, oh, we'll build a promised land that can be. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace with just a shadow. Peace like an air. 
mystery We'll build a land where we bring the good tidings to all the afflicted and all those who mourn and we'll give them garlands instead of ashes We'll build a land where peace is born Come build a land where sisters and brothers Anointed by God may then create peace When justice shall roll down like waters Peace like an ever-flowing stream Raising up devastations from old, revering ruins of generations. We'll build a land of people so bold. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace. We just a shadow down like waters, a peace like an ever flowing stream. Thank you, Carol. Next, we have our unison affirmation. And the affirmation reminds us why we all come here together. And it will be on your screens, and we will read this together. So those on Zoom, please unmute. And those here in the sanctuary, we'll read this together. Love, Love is the spirit of, of this fellowship and service, and service is its law. Is law. This, this, this is our great covenant, covenant to, dwell to dwell together, together in, peace, in peace, to seek to the, truth seek the truth in love, and, love, and to, to help, help one another. One another. <laughs> now is a time in our service where we pause the recording. Thank you, Carol. And now we're going to sing to each other. And we do this twice in the service. This is one of those times where we stand up, we join a circle, the words are on the screen, and we'll be singing to each other to celebrate and in gratitude what we have together and individually in this world. And so please stand and form a circle. And we run... We run through those verses twice. Now we're going to take just a moment of quick, calm meditation, prayer, devotion, whatever you want to call it, but just something to quiet our minds before our speaker. And I'd like you to put your feet on the ground, your hands just lightly in your lap or wherever is most comfortable for you. 
and um, we're just going to breathe for a moment. And then when we're, Carol will let us know when we're done. And so take some deep breaths, just like. I like to do it to a count of five myself. So we'll just take a moment. Thank you, Carol. I don't know about you guys, but I find when I sit and just relax, I feel my shoulders coming down and the tensions. And so it's a nice little break for me. Now, I would like to present the presentation on Border Angels by Anna Miguel. Anna Miguel is the Educational Programs Coordinator for Border Angels. Anna Miguel was born and raised in San Diego. Anna earned her associate's degree from San Diego City College in Social and Behavioral Sciences. Then she transferred to San Diego State University where she earned her bachelor's in Chicana Chicano Studies. Anna joined the Border Angels in September 2022 serving as the Educational Programs Coordinator. Anna is passionate about serving her community and educating people on the mission of Border Angels, including protecting the innate rights of migrants and refugees. Please join me in welcoming Anna Miguel. Oh, Anna's going to be on Zoom. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, I will be sharing. Okay. Uh, first off, I do just want to say thank you. I really appreciate that, you know, we're able to be here again for another year. Last year was my first year presenting uh, to all of you, so I'm really happy that we were able to return again this year. Uh, so I will be jumping into the Border Angels presentation. So what is Border Angels? Border Angels is a nonprofit organization that advocates for human rights, immigration reform, and social justice with a special focus on issues related to the U.S.-Mexican border. And now some background history. The Border Angels was established in 1986 by Enrique Morones. It was originally set up to provide support to the migrants living in the, in the canyons of, the sort of San Diego County. Uh, since then, it has expanded to conduct humanitarian work for migrants along the entire U.S. Mexico border region. The Border Angels now also serve the San Diego County immigration population through various uh, outreach programs, which I will speak about today. And it's also very important to note that years of poor economic policies and immigration policies have created the situation where we're still seeing that people are continuing to risk their lives in the search of a better life here in the United States. <clears throat> so since the start of NAFTA on January 1st, 1994, there has been a steady increase in the militarization of the U.S. And that militarization looked like an increase of border patrol agents directly on the field as well as an increase of technology that's been used to detect migrants that are crossing. Uh, that technology 
looked like uh, use of infrared technology to even detect individuals crossing at night, uh, you know, by detecting their body heat, as well as expanding the border wall. Uh, currently, within just the past couple of years, we've seen that the border wall has increased to 30 feet high. Um, and even though it's been the height of the wall has increased, we're still seeing that individuals are continuing to cross and risk their lives jumping over the border. <clears throat> Another policy is Operation Gatekeeper, which was implemented in October 1st of that same year. And under this policy, uh, what Border Patrol and really, you know, uh, the government assumed was that by making it more difficult for individuals to cross, uh, you know, by pushing them through the desert or making individuals even navigating past through the ocean, uh, that these migrants would actually stop we saw the exact opposite. We saw that individuals were actually seeking these more dangerous because oftentimes uh, they're cheaper than other routes that are safer or easier to navigate. Uh, so clearly this policy, even though it had a goal in mind, it really did not. And so since Operation Gatekeeper, an estimated 11,000 people have lost their lives by making this journey. Uh, one reason is the extreme heat. Uh, so here in San Diego, uh, where we're at, <clears throat> we do see temperatures get into the triple digits at times. Uh, people are still crossing during those during that temperature. Uh, I know just last year when I was doing a water drop with a student group, we actually saw temperatures in 120 degrees. Uh, it was super humid. I couldn't understand how people were still crossing during uh, during those temperatures. Uh, <clears throat> And also people sometimes assume that during the winter it's a lot easier. It's not. Uh, during the winter we see freezing cold temperatures here in this area. And unfortunately uh, we have seen different cases where individuals have passed away due to hypothermia because they are not prepared. Another reason is lack of food and water. Individuals can only carry so much before it gets too much for them. Uh, people get tired depending on how long the trek is for, for each individual which is why it's so important for us to go out and leave water gallons out in the desert in these areas to make sure that you know we're able to assist anybody in any way that uh and lastly the overall perilous nature of the trip uh has unfortunately cost many people their lives again people may not be well prepared to make this journey uh this trip is very very difficult and oftentimes people are just not prepared with the tire that they're wearing, whether it's shoes. We have seen that even volunteers that have joined us, uh, their shoes have actually melted uh, due to the high heat in the desert. Uh, many times, many of these individuals just uh, are tired enough when they will actually start leaving items behind us. Uh, so Border Rangers' focus is on reducing the number of fatalities and supported lives, hoping to improve their circumstances. <laughs> so our mission. Our mission is to promote a culture of love through advocacy, education, by creating a social consciousness and engaging in direct action to defend the rights of migrants and refugees. Here you will see a couple pictures. So this is actually from a student group that came out with us for a water drop. And then here uh, is a picture of us taking donations out to one of the shelters that we support in Peace One. So our current program, people are Often more familiar with our water drop program, which you can see a picture here. Here is our day labor outreach program, our shelter aid program, <clears throat> our Familias Reunidas or Reuniting Families Bond program. And then we also have our Volviendo Casa program or Returning Home program, and then our education program. And I will begin with our water drop. <clears throat> so through our water drop, volunteers are able to join us and trek into the desert and place water as well as other life-saving supplies along these migrants up in hopes of preventing further deaths at the U.S.-Mexico border. <clears throat> so the way that we find these routes is by looking at death maps. Like the name states, uh, these maps are uh, where, in, unfortunately, remains of individuals who have crossed um, or found. And by looking at these, at these death maps, we're able to visit these different routes and see uh, what what's left behind, or what evidence is there that people have. Uh, so that's how we also see, you know, which routes are more heavily trafficked. So the items that we'll typically find along these routes are 
water bottles uh, that are typically consumed with Mexican branding. Uh, we will also see clothing that's left behind. <clears throat> uh, clothing can look like shirts, uh, pants, uh, shoes. It's really something that we find a lot, as well as backpacks. <clears throat> and we usually find uh, the clothes that's left behind closer to the freeway, uh, just because the coyote or the smuggler, the person that's bleeding an uh, individual, will already have somebody at the end point, which is typically near a freeway, uh, to pick them up. So individuals will often have a change of clothes, a clean change of clothes in their back to still change into. So that way, if they are to be stopped, if they, if Border Patrol see them, uh, they aren't as easily able to be spotted. Uh, individuals that are crossing, they want to make sure once they're ready here, that they're able to assimilate as quickly as possible. <laughs> So the reason that we leave water down out in the desert is because the main cause of death for individual crossing is dehydration. Uh, again, water is very heavy, especially if you're doing a route that can take weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, that's actually one of the first items that we see that individuals will consume the quickest, or if they're if it's just too heavy for them, they'll leave it. Um, <clears throat> which is why we leave these water gallons. Um, along with this program, we do visit the desert at least once a month. Uh, currently, our volunteer water drop program runs on the second Saturday. And every month we do cycle through these different routes to visit, again, making sure that we're able to check if the items that we're leaving behind are consumed or if we need to replenish this route. Uh, 2021 has been the deadliest year on record for border crossing, and 2023 had record Again, like I mentioned earlier, last year in June or July, we were seeing a uh, high heat advisory. We were out there at four noon and we were already seeing triple digit numbers. Uh, so this is something that's very difficult, but as well as something that's very important for us to take groups up to be exposed to these realities, as our goal is always to humanize and to really expose individuals to what the reality of our migrant brothers and sisters are facing, uh, making their way to the United States. And here are a couple pictures. So here you can see uh, our, <clears throat> our team out at a water drop. And then here is actually a group of volunteers that we were leading uh, through a water drop as well. I know oftentimes people have a misconception that the desert can be like very easy to navigate, flat land, uh, but we're often having to go through canyons as well as you must know, be different uh, brushes, I guess, and bushes and, and other items. Are. We always advise individuals to you know, hiking boots, to have uh, to dress in layers, to have a hiking basket, to be able to even have water for themselves. And that's something that many individuals who are crossing, whether they're uh, you know, paying somebody to cross them, they don't have that preparation that we are able to provide out with and something that we always share with our volunteers as well is that it's a privilege to be out there to be that prepared and many times you know uh, there's people that are crossing who aren't prepared who don't have hiking boots who don't have uh long pants that are able to protect them from the different branches that we're hitting along the way um <clears throat> and another big reality for us that many migrants don't have is that we are able to make it safely back home uh, we're able to make it back to our cars and AC and know that we'll be fine by the end of the day. But for many individuals, that's not a reality for them. And here are a couple more pictures. So here's a water gallon. Uh, so with these water gallons, we always make sure to tape the tops of the gallons as with high heat, these gallons will explode out uh, in the desert. <clears throat> and we also make sure to use neon tape uh, so individuals are able to also uh, see these gallons and these items that we're leaving behind us. And then here is another picture of the hikes that we do. So as you can see, we are having to be hands-free of uh, something that we always let people know. So, you know, make sure that they are able to carry items in their backpacks. So that way we're able to, you know, catch ourselves if we do trip or if we just need to uh, hold on to anything as well. And when we do these water drops, we do know that oftentimes people assume that we're just leaving trash out in the desert, but we also make sure to clean up after the items that we leave behind. Uh, because again, we are aware that we're leaving gallons as well as other items. 
And then here is a picture of items that they have been consumed. So here are the water gallons in the back and then the pop-off cans that we request for anybody that joins us to also provide. Uh, something that might be a little obvious, but we always request pop-off cans because we don't want to assume that a migrant is crossing with a can opener. We want to make sure that the items that we're leaving behind are as easily consumable as possible. So next, I'm going to touch on a different policy, Title 42. <clears throat> so Title 42 was a Trump-era policy that used the pandemic as a pretext to expel refugee families and asylum seekers uh, under the guise of protecting public health. Uh, many public health officials actually spoke out against this policy, claiming it was doing the exact Something that we were seeing in detention centers was that there was actually a big uptake of COVID cases uh, because the individuals detained were not given access to washing stations. They didn't have hand sanitizer. They didn't even have face masks. Uh, we would have individuals contacting us saying, oh, I want to be able to donate these items. Like, are we able to, are we able to uh, go out and donate them? Those. And unfortunately, we did have to let them know that we didn't even have access to the detention centers during this time. <clears throat> so if people were testing COVID positive, uh, they unfortunately did not have a space to isolate. And again, that's why we did see a big increase of COVID cases in the detention centers. So with the end of Title 42 last year, uh, we did see that the Border Patrol returned to pre-pandemic rules for enforcing immigration laws under Title 8. And under Title VIII, uh, individuals that are caught crossing unlawfully, uh, they do or they are subject to a five to ten year ban. <clears throat> under Title Forty Two, we did not see that, uh, but that was implemented. So that is a big difference between these two policies. <clears throat> and with the transition to the CBP One app, uh, this is now the, the main way for individuals to seek asylum. Uh, in the United States. And now this application has been seen as problematic as it is an application on your smartphone. Uh, with this application, we have seen the individuals who are of darker skin complexion, their features are not being read. So the application will actually say that we can't move on uh, because we just can't read that you know, you're a person and their pictures are just not seen as being reliable. Another thing was that it assumes access to reliable connection to Wi-Fi throughout the whole time that they're making their trek to the United States. <clears throat> I was actually just out there yesterday volunteering uh, with a group uh, that does work in the desert as well. And I lost the signal and I have a smartphone. Now, for individuals who don't have a smartphone and that are losing signal, that can cause issues in their process of how they're moving forward in the application. Another issue, again, is uh, compatible technology. Many folks do not have uh, access to a smartphone. Oftentimes, they will be using a lot older phone, and they aren't even able to uh, open it in their phone. Uh, lastly, another issue that we were seeing was error codes in English. So even though the application may have been translated to their respective uh, language that they're able to understand, error codes that they were receiving were still in English. So even then, if they were receiving an error code, they were not able to understand it because there was in a language that. <clears throat> oh, with the end of Title 42, we did see something that I am, I know that a lot of people actually aren't aware of, which are these open air detention sites out in the desert. So these open air detention sites are unofficial detention centers. Uh, what we saw with the end of Title 42 is that we we're actually receiving a high influx of calls at our office. Uh, people were letting us know that they were out in the desert and that they needed support. Uh, we were given at first the number of about 200 migrants out in the desert. When we got out there, we saw closer to 500 to 700 migrants out without any shelter <clears throat> and without any care from Border Patrol. What we were being told was that Border Patrol was only providing a small little water bottle as well as a small nutrient bar for the individual. Uh, so we were able to do a call out for our volunteers and our supporters uh, to provide donations. And we were thankfully able to take water gallons, sunscreen. Uh, we were able to prepare lunches for them as well. It was something that was very, very sad to see. Many of the individual, individuals that were out there were actually using their own shirts to create makeshift hats of protection from the sun for themselves. A lot of them were clearly dehydrated, super chap lip. Uh, they 
looked disoriented and unfortunately border patrol was not doing anything uh the resources that we were able to provide a lot of times did fall on nonprofits like us to be able to provide those resources to them <clears throat> we were also seeing that individuals were actually using any trash that they had as well to create little makeshift shelters i'm not sure if you can see it here in this picture uh, but people were using any sort of trash to be able to create a shelter that would protect them from the sun and the weather. So migrants were enduring inhuman conditions, extreme weather, a lack of medical care for for people out there. Um, and we did see migrants from all over. Uh, I know oftentimes it's because we are located in San Diego, people assume that the only uh, migrants that we see are people from Mexico, but that's actually the exact opposite. We see individuals from all over the world. Here at these detention centers, we've seen people from Colombia, from Venezuela, from China, uh, from Russia as well as Ukraine, and even from African states as well. Uh, so it's something that, again, migration is a global issue. It's something that's not just one person, but we see many, many individuals from all over the world uh, continuing to risk their lives and hope for a better life. So our next program that I'm going to touch on is our day labor outreach program. So the term day labor is applied to individuals that search for work in construction and landscaping project-based work. We often see them outside of Home Depots and Lowe's. Uh, they're out there from six in the morning all the way up until six in the afternoon, just waiting. Uh, they don't know for sure when their next payday is gonna be or when the next day they're gonna have work, but they're still out there every single day uh, waiting to see if that day will be the lucky day that they get paid. Fortunately, this community of workers is often subject to discrimination. That discrimination looks like uh, um, <clears throat> discrimination from employees as well as security on the location, uh, even customers. We do know that customers, unfortunately, have called ICE on these uh, laborers that are out there, assuming that they are undocumented, and unfortunately putting them in a dangerous situation. Oh, that discrimination, another form of discrimination that we've seen or that I have seen as well is security on these sites actually pepper spraying these laborers. Uh, these laborers are some of the kindest people that I have had the privilege to work with and to get to know. Uh, a lot of them are older folk as well. So it's very disheartening to hear that, that there's people there that are being hateful to them just because of their status. And again, these laborers are doing work that oftentimes people see as being beneath them. Uh, they're doing the work that nobody else wants to do. And I know that's sometimes a big uh, thing that we hear with this population of migrants and immigrants is that they're stealing people's jobs, but they're not stealing people's jobs. They're doing the work that people assume isn't the work that somebody else should be doing. <clears throat> so by being able to go out to these different sites, we are able to engage with them, hear their stories, get to know them, as well as provide food, water, clothes, um, as well as money or red cards for these individuals. Oftentimes, the lunches that we provide, these laborers let us know that that's their first meal of the day. Uh, they won't use any money that they've been able to make for themselves, hoping that they'll be able to send that back to their families and their countries of origin. Uh, so something that I always push for students or any, anybody that I lead out for these very outreach programs is for them to really just even share the name or hear the labor share the name back. They might be something that sounds really small, but it's honestly something that goes a long way because that might be the first time that that labor is able to share a little bit of themselves to somebody else. I know oftentimes these labors are very appreciative of us just even being out there and just getting uh, to hear how they're doing. It's always something that it always really warms my heart to hear them even just uh, recognize me and, you know, uh, say hi to me, just by saying hi, Anna, you know, <laughs> and, you know, seeing that we're creating that partnership and that collabor collaboration with one another and seeing that, you know, we're really being seen as a resource and not just like individuals that show up one day and then don't show up. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, that are out there and that are continuing to support this program as well. So next is our Shelter Aid Program. So through this program, we do have a special budget allocated to assist the different shelters in Tijuana. Uh, so through this program, we are able to provide funding uh, for rent, utilities, construction, and growth. So here you can see a couple of pictures of some construction that we've been able to help with, as well as some donations we've been able to provide to other 
Currently, the largest shelter that we do provide support for houses 1,600 migrants. 600 of those migrants are children. <clears throat> and we currently do support 12 shelters, including an LGBT, LGBT space, a Muslim shelter, and a Haitian migrant shelter as well. So during the pandemic, our program actually did have to uh, close because we were able to cross into Tijuana. And this was also a time where, you know, we understood that migrants really needed that. Uh, so <clears throat> something that we were able to begin was the Caravan of Love. Through the Caravan of Love, that is an opportunity where volunteers are able to join us and engage with us to visit these different shelters. We will meet at our community center and then caravan down with Anna, uh, visiting a respective shelter. And the director will let us know, you know, what specific donations they may need for them. <clears throat> Something that we are very grateful and that we're really happy that we were able to do with the with the return of the caravan of love was have volunteers who joined us to provide any resources or services that they may have to these different communities. So here we have a lady named Karen, who was actually from the Berkeley area, who came, drove down, and was able to provide vision exams to the different migrants at these laborers. It was really sweet to see uh, some migrants line up and get excited for an exam. Even if they knew they had 20-20 vision, their vision was perfectly fine, but they still wanted to feel taken care of. So they still were able to get checked, and for any individual that needed glasses, they were able to get their glasses that same day. And then here we have another volunteer, Christian. Who was, who was a barber in Tijuana, and he was able to cut the hair of uh, both adults and uh, and children as well. And it was just really sweet to see uh, everybody just feel so happy and, to, you know, have them have that time for self-care for, for them. Uh, at the end of the day, Christian actually let us know that he was also living in a shelter. He was from Venezuela, and he was making, or he had his appointment that following week, uh, to meet with immigration and to be able to go and meet his sponsor up in, in Las Vegas. So it was a really full circle moment that he understood, you know, what it was like for a migrant to live in a shelter and to provide uh, whatever service he could to individuals as well. Next, I'm going to touch on our Familias Reunidas or Reuniting Family Bond Program. So the past administration's anti-immigrant agenda has resulted in an increase in immigrants and asylum seekers being held in ICE immigrant prisons. So some individuals detained qualify to be released on bond but remain in custody because they cannot afford the high bond amount. Uh, something that's also very important to know with or when paying bonds, but it does require you to have uh, your residency, so that's your green card, or to be a citizen of the United States. So if individuals do not have access to be able to pay for the high bond amount or do not have somebody that can pay that bond amount because of their legal status, they will reach out to And oftentimes people in, in these detention centers will actually pass out our phone and we will have uh, people contacting us that way, just letting us know, oh, I got your phone from somebody else. So, you know, I wanted to see if you could also. <clears throat> So we did navigate or activate our network uh, in December 2019, and as, as of January 2020, we have helped over 220 immigrants. Uh, just this year, I think this year has been very, very good to us uh, because we have been able to post about three or four um, more. We've been able to uh, help pay the bonds for three more, three or four more individuals. Um, and then we have been able to raise over $50,000 from donations, which is something, again, that we are very, very so the minimum bond amount is 1500 but many of those who we have helped, uh, we have seen that the minimum is 5000 We have even seen these bonds set as high as $10,000. And that there really isn't um, any, like one reason as to why somebody's bond is placed higher than another. It really is kind of Without explanation, we have even seen people who are first-time crossers who their bonds have been set um, at a very high So we do assist those inside the Otay Mesa, Adelanto, and Imperial Regional uh, Detention Centers here in San Diego. So here is a quick graphic for this program as well. Uh, so as you can see, the average time uh, that somebody is spent in detention is a month. The average bond is of 6289 
And then we have been able to help individuals from 27 different countries. And this number uh, is up to 125, if not 126 people free from detention as well. So next, I'm going to touch on our Volviendo a Casa, or Returning Home program. So it is <clears throat> important to note that all the programs that I have touched on before have been for individuals who have been able to make it to the United States alive. A big reality is, is something that we understand is that oftentimes individuals are able to make it to the United States safely, but there are times when individuals unfortunately lose their lives making the trip to the United States. So with our Volviendo Casa program, we have been able to help support low-income families working with the respective couple uh, to be able to return uh, those remains back to that family to be able to lay their family members. So we do help pay funeral expenses and transportation uh, for these families to have be able to offer a proper birth. Uh, it's very important to know as well that these are real people. You know, these are humans who had a story, who had had a dream, uh, who had a goal in mind, and unfortunately that dream or that goal cost them their lives. Uh, again, it's very important to know that oftentimes these journeys that individuals take can be very dangerous. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with La Bestia or the Beast, which is a train that takes individuals from southern Mexico all the way up to northern uh, Mexico. And this is a very dangerous form of transportation for individuals. We have seen that people sleeping on top of the train uh, fall off or they fall asleep and they lose their lives. Uh, they aren't able to hold on to the train anymore. Uh, many of these individuals as well that take La Bestia, unfortunately, are decapitated. Uh, we have seen individuals have lost limbs making the journey here as well. Is anybody and it's just something that's very heavy. Hearing? Uh, here. I'm sorry. You guys are not having trouble? Nope. Okay. Muddled. Okay. That's a good word. I I wrote muddled. So um, I think she only has one more program after this. And um, I mean, it's such important work. Because it's all... They're, they're having problems hearing you in the, in the... Oh, okay. Can you hear me or... Is it any better? Say a little more yeah. for me. <laughs> is it is it better or is it still is it still bad? I think that may be better, but I I can't tell if I I can better. hear fine, and I'm uh, yeah, okay. on Zoom. Yeah, I can hear okay. fine. Yeah, I have one more slide, and then and then we're done. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I will just finish real quick. Um, so lastly, I'm just going to touch on our educational program. So at Border Angels, we seek to engage students and community members in different activities. And some of these activities are the following, which are the day labor outreach, our educational water drop, our Chicano Park tour, and our in-person or virtual activities. And then here are just a couple examples of these different programs that we have. And now what can you do? For one, start a conversation. You just got educated, share a little bit about what you learned today with anybody that you may know. Uh, you can host a fundraiser for any donations, physical donations or monetary donations as well. Uh, here with this QR code, uh, you can uh, access our different social media pages to follow and share our posts. And lastly, if you have a skill, use your skill to get involved, whether that's uh, fundraising or whether you know, you're able to cut hair, you know, no pressure, uh, but you're also able to get involved with any skills. And then lastly, donating. You can donate monetarily through our Venmo, our PayPal, or our website, or you can also donate by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and our contact information. And so we are located in San Diego at the Sherman Heights Community Center. Uh, and then here is just a couple contact information as well. Uh, so here is my email, and then if you have any general inquiries, please feel free to email admin. And then that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And, you know, a few, what we do here is that we have our social justice Sundays, and um, 
a few weeks back or months, um, Noreen had gotten us in touch with a speaker that gives uh, wheelchairs to people in need. And it was for, wow, $100. You can just change somebody's entire future and life with being able to get to school or you know, to work. All of these things just with such a minimal amount. And that reminded me a little bit about Border Angels, that not only can they change somebody's life by offering haircuts and other things, but they can actually save, li save lives by providing water. So very worthwhile. And it's just a reminder of how powerful we are, that our small actions can really help either save a life or just change a life, as well as just a smile can improve somebody's day. So thank you all, and thank you, Anna, for all the work you're doing. It's really important. Uh, um, could I say something? We'll be around for a few minutes on Zoom if you guys have any questions. OK. Now we go to the music magic of Carol Cole for our closing hymn, number 146, Soon the Day Will Arrive. Please stand as you're able, and the words will be on the screen. Soon the day will arrive when we will be together and no longer will we live in fear. And the children will smile without wondering whether on that day thunder clouds will appear. Wait and see. If we share, if we care, you and me. Wait and see, wait and see what a world there can be. If we share, if we care, you and me. Some have dreamed, some have died to make a bright tomorrow and our vision remains in our hearts now the torch must be passed with the hope not in sorrow and a promise to make a new start wait and see wait and see what a world there can be if we share if we care you and me wait and see wait and see what a world there can be if we share if we care you and me thank you carol and I am now going to extinguish the chalice. May the chalice flame in our hearts remain unextinguished. May it ignite our energies, our drive, our resolve. We keep this flame lit in our hearts, sharing our light, with all those we meet along our path. And this is now the time where we do our second circle. And the words will be on the screen. And it's let there be peace on earth. So please form a circle and join hands. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With earth as our mother, we are family. Let us walk with each other 